Welcome to the Experience Focused Leaders Podcast. My name is Alex Shemalenko. I'm CEO and founder of Relate To, and we are on the mission, both with the podcast and with Relate To, to bring the most important ideas to life. And how do we do that? We do that through amazing, immersive, engaging experiences that move your organization forward, move your customers forward, and move us as a society forward. So if you love ideas, if you love bringing these ideas to life, stick around. Also, at the end of the podcast, we'll reveal how you could potentially be a guest speaker on the podcast as well. Let's get started. Welcome to another exciting episode of Experience Focused Leaders Podcast. I am excited to introduce you to Mark Osborne. Mark is named by AdAge Magazine as Marketing Technology Trailblazer. He's the author of number one uh, bestseller in B2B marketing, uh, Are Your Leads Killing Your Business? Uh, he is now at Cantor as VP of Growth Strategy for Analytics, Growth and Strategy for Analytics. And uh, on top of all this, Mark uh, also uh, runs Modern Revenue Strategies. Uh, Mark, welcome to the pod. Thanks so much, Alex. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, excited to have you. We have so many points to connect on, uh, but I think most of the audience is going to be intrigued by the title of your book because people normally don't think of leads as something that's going to kill their business. They think of something that's going to fuel their business. And, um, you know, we'd love to hear the thesis and the insight that kind of provoked such a such an interesting take. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so th there's a couple things at play there. The, um, you know, part of what prompted me to write the book was the lockdowns uh, that came with, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic um, really sort of changed the landscape a lot in the B2B space. A number of companies sort of saw it as putting everything on pause. Uh, mm -hmm. And they kind of, you know, put things on pause or maybe turned up the volume on this or that, things that they, you know, could do or had been doing uh, before. And then once, you know, people started traveling again and, and once, you know, people were back in the office, they kind of returned to business as usual. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a there's a phrase from, I think it was McKinsey that said that the pandemic lockdowns accelerated a lot of trends by 10 years in 10 months. Uh, and we've definitely seen that in the B2B, you know, marketing and sales landscape. And so these companies that sort of went on pause, they're now right. 10 years behind their competitors uh, mm -hmm. that adapted to these trends that were already, the trends were already in place, but they really accelerated during the lockdown. And those trends really relate to um, the way that buyers buy in the modern B2B landscape. Uh, and it, it really changed dramatically in moving towards more of a, you know, uh, the ability to interact without salespeople so that now 70 percent of the you know customer journey for enterprise, um, especially software and technology uh, or services related to those, 70 percent of that journey is done before they ever engage with uh, with a vendor. Whereas in, in the old days, it used to be that a company would, um, you know, as they were evaluating solutions, reach out to one of the top three or five vendors or maybe a couple of them and say, mm -hmm. hey, let's talk about, you know, what I'm looking for, see if your option is, is a good one for me, or maybe you can mm -hmm. point me in some good directions. That just doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and, and likewise, there was this, there's this sort of antiquated uh, concept in the marketplace of, well, anyone that downloads our white paper is obviously a qualified lead. Uh, and so we should, you know, get, they should get the same uh, attention as any other lead. Uh, mm -hmm, that we're talking mm -hmm. to in the process. And, and so companies that haven't adapted to this uh, sort of new landscape, and there's a lot of other trends that I talk about in the book and, and elsewhere, um, what they're, what's happening is the companies that have adapted are pulling the best opportunities out of the marketplace right away. They're servicing them very differently, and then they're winning those opportunities. Whereas businesses that haven't adapted are really left with the worst opportunities in the marketplace, which they're then expending a significant portion of their resources chasing those opportunities, uh, which really sort of creates this death spiral. And this is how leads can kill your business. 
Got uh, it. So because, you're saying is so bec because you're no longer able to go to, for example, as frequently as you used to, to events where you meet, let's say, high quality, um, high right. quality leads, right? You have a lot of digital stuff and there's a lot of fluff in the digital. And so then you have to build out this mega sales um, development organization that's processing these leads or you kind of you're investing um you know sales resource and folks that may not be ready for the market because you're just kind of doing this old school undifferentiated digital stuff well that's, that's near and dear right. to my heart wearing my other hat as as uh relate to because what would we we absolutely think is naive is to think oh yeah i downloaded this white paper right and and therefore i'm in right i'm interested that's so, right. right so like in and then you know, like, and then I get happy to keep sending me stuff, right? Versus like I, I'm viewing the white paper. I'm not like going through some friction. I'm engaging with it right now, or or an ebook or whatever is the, the, the case study. I'm deeply That's engaging right. with it. That's mimicking a an information and insight about really an engaged user that actually is right now as like is going through, you know, potentially equivalent of a, a sales interaction. But it's going through that in digital. And then if I'm able to identify these folks uh, and then put my sales um, superstars to engage That's them right. and help them answer the questions that are not found in the ebook or that are not found in the case study, that's where the the op the opposite of killing your business. Is that am I reading that's this? Very correctly? close, very close. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. it, the, the only sort of nuance that I would uh, interject there, and, and you probably have better statistics on this than I do, but uh, the number of companies that sort of treat every engagement as fully engaged, like there's no sort of scoring of the quality of a lead or the ripeness uh, of an opportunity. Basically, if they download a single white paper, they're as qualified as the person who is downloading really lower funnel uh, type content and engaging with that lower funnel content. You probably know better than I how few companies are even tracking engagement with content uh, and, and sort of that ability to know through tools like Relay2 of the people that are engaging with even certain parts of the content that might be more related yeah. to kind of buying decisions versus upper funnel researching uh, content, which is more kind of informational. Uh, and, and so companies that have this same sort of monolithic approach to the marketplace yeah. Uh, and aren't using data and technology to inform that, uh, wind up really being left behind because their competitors that are using data and technology to inform the qualification, to inform the you know, sort of readiness of a target um, yeah. that are using you know, data and technology to build you know, scores of qualification or to then put them into more of a nurturing cycle until they are ready and then once they are ready, really give them that one-to-one, -one, you know, account-based marketing uh, focus. Yeah. They're taking all the best opportunities out of the market. And so when you're only fighting for the scraps, you wind yeah. up with customers that distract you uh, right. from your core business proposition. They, they require a lot of custom work. They don't want the same things that the marketplace generally wants. They aren't aligned with your and buying pushes you further and further and further behind the competition it creates this death spiral which i've seen many times kill businesses yeah i think i think what you're really pointing to is this um you know and, and you you could have been in the marketing and analytics world and 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 supporting you know very large deals as well so you you sort of get obviously this connection between for example a content let's just say content is a proxy for interaction then the sort of how you push it through all the way to sales um, outcomes. And it That's does right. feel that while people talk the talk, you know, there's very little actual deep attribution between, you know, people designing the content or even writing the copy for the content to revenue. And then the marketers are still very, very happy with, great, look, we got you a number we hit our That's MQL right. number, right? Like, great. Like, how they come up with that number? Is that it all connected to, you know, let's hope SQLs at least. But even even the sales team, right? Like you said, maybe supporting the wrong type of customers because they're desperate. Um, That's right. And so you're not you're not converting that into the revenue that the quality revenue that you're looking for. 
And so I think that part of the challenge that we've seen is that the, the kind of designers uh, don't speak the same language as the marketers or the sellers. They use different That's tools. Right. And, um, and so there's not, there's, it, it takes a you know, very determined CMO or chief revenue officer to connect the dots. But I think that, that's been part of the struggle. The tools are different. Like you would never get a, a sales rep in their right mind to, to figure out how Marketo works, right? Or <laughs> you know, if you want your sales reps to start designing PowerPoint type of things, you will get in all heaps of trouble, especially in regulated right. industries. So I think that's, but yet you need to, right? You need to be able to empower um, kind of a marketing grade, professional grade content for sales teams to bring to customers, right? That do, that talk to the customers when the sales uh, team is not in the room. So how do you think about this from the tooling and and kind of just having that, you know, having the, the ability to have that conversation? Is that part of the problem? It's just teams are misaligned. Um, that, that's a big part of the problem. And in fact, mm -hmm. so in, in the book, we lay out sort of like a five-step process mm -hmm. uh, for creating, you know, really a, a system of solutions that work. And, and part of that, being this upper funnel alignment, um, and the way that you do that is by getting marketing sales and even customer success on a shared uh, scorecard. Uh, so they have shared KPIs. Now, what we see is some of the best businesses have different weightings. So people on the marketing team are weighted more towards uh, certain KPIs, but those other KPIs are still part, you know, the renewal rate, the upsell rate, that's still part of what they look at and what they're uh, sort of measured on as success. Bringing in a bunch of leads that aren't then renewing or expanding their relationship, that's going to kill your business. Uh, and so, Instead of just uh, measuring customer success on a renewal or a, an upsell rate, having marketing involved with that too uh, mm -hmm. can be really valuable. So for starters, it's you know understanding it as a complete revenue system that begins with attracting the right prospects, then moves into accelerating those opportunities through the pipeline, things like you think of a sales, and then moves into activating clients for renewals, upsells, and referrals. And in fact, we will uh, do a diagnostic with companies uh, to help them understand of those three areas, where's the biggest opportunity to make an immediate impact on your business? Like what in, and we'll do some diagnostics, use some, you know, real uh, benchmarks against other uh, similar companies in the space to say, well, where are your metrics today? And then we can build this scorecard uh, that drives the optimization and the sort of the teamwork to build together because, Customer success oftentimes has insights about what customers actually love about the product. Yeah. Marketing may not know. Right. Uh, and marketing understands tools. You mentioned Marketo, but tools and approaches and you know the ability to you know build really beautiful things that sales may not uh, sort of be knowledgeable about. Likewise, sales knows the objections that come up that we need to anticipate mm -hmm. uh, in advance so that we're really setting up the conversation well. So one of the ways that we see really successful there is when you have a, a customer journey map that mm -hmm. you are then understanding at each stage of the journey from you know awareness to you know sort of intent to engagement all the way through to that uh, you know second moment of truth of should I buy again, should I advocate in the marketplace? Um, when you understand that customer journey, and the content that the questions that they need to answer at every stage mm -hmm. of that, then you start to understand, well, what's the content that would influence each yeah. stage of that? Uh, and what's the data that we can use to measure have they moved from that stage or not? Um, and so having that really much more precise understanding of where your customers are in the process by bringing in data that um, aligns to that customer journey, then you know when they're ready for the full court press from sales. Uh, and then because you're not accepting every MQL as the same quality of a yeah. lead, you're freeing up time for the sales team to really focus on that one-to-one -one engagements for those opportunities that matter, those opportunities that are ripe. Uh, and likewise, 
You can use that same uh, sources of data to understand when customers are at, at risk of churning or at that opportunity, that inflection point uh, to expand or grow your relationship with them. Again, some sales and marketing capabilities that customer success isn't always expert at. Uh, and so when you bring that team together, you really create that alignment. Yeah. And I would add in a software world, there's almost a third, uh, a fourth, I guess, group that, that's engaged, which is the product. Uh, and so there's sort of a, a movement toward product led growth. That's which right. Is, that's right. You know, even making this landscape more complicated because the people that are signing up to try out your product are definitely not the types of people that would be ready for full court sales. Uh, engagement, right? They're they probably, you know, if you you lucky if they are, it's great, right? And like sometimes you get a CEO signing up, and you know they're hands on and they want to, you know, it's something that's important to them. But I think quite quite typically would be somebody who is innovative but may not have, um, you know, be in the position of authority, but they could be influencers, right? And and the the you that's need right. to time that approach. So I think that landscape is. And the and the and the related to that the customer journey and the, um, the 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 content that supports it or the touch points that support it is becoming complicated, right? Some of the touch points right. could be a product tour that either That's you right. do through the product itself or through some interactive product tours. So one one thing that I do find um, challenging for people is that while we all like that sort of funnel visual mm -hmm. right it work kind of bow tie if you kind of if you're if you're, sure. you're selling services it's obviously a bit more messier than that because you have yeah. different different people with different objectives right like you know coming into that journey so how do you find um you know and given that obviously your background was contar as well where you kind of you know you're you're such so analytically driven as, as an organization and and um yeah. you know, experts in in that right typically that starts at the top of the funnel, right? Was maybe ad supported, uh, heavily ad supported uh, movement. But then how do you continue that? Because like you could see scenarios where in a B2B or some sort of complex sale, like you, ads could be engaging people in your target account, sure. right? To, right? To go and try and pilot um, the solution. So tell, tell us a little bit about that mixed up notion that no longer works of like sure. you know, top of the funnel to bottom of the funnel. Yeah. So I, I love the bow tie analogy, but that's, that's really thinking through it from the business. Like the business wants to grow after they uh, close that first deal. It's not thinking about it through the lens of the customer, which that customer view is, you know, as you described, messy. very squiggly. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Very messy, very squiggly. What we have seen be really successful is to use data uh, to sort of build uh, an understanding of uh, where they are and moving through the process, recognizing that there are going to be recurrent loops. Uh, and so, and if you think about the, the process that people go through in, in making decisions is, you know, should I solve this at all? Okay, well, what is data that would indicate that, that they have decided it's you know, to prioritize it. Well, they're they're reading certain type of content. They're engaging with certain people. You can get intent data out there about, you know, are they reading reviews on, mm -hmm. you know, G2, whatever it might be for, for your industry. There are lots of ways. Or if you're creating the content and then measuring the people that are consuming it, you start to understand, okay, they're at that stage of the funnel. If they're at that stage of the customer journey, all of your content should be focused on just getting them to the next stage. Uh, mm. Not, and, and so for example, uh, if someone is evaluating, is this worth doing at all? You shouldn't be advocating why your way of doing it is the best way to do it. Because they haven't even decided. They still do like it. figuring out if this is the right problem to solve, right? Like that, you, you right. got to educate them about the problem, right? That's yeah. right. I, I talk about, you know, enterprise companies. There's 10 smart things they could do in the next 12 months. They really only have the bandwidth to do three. Uh, and so helping them prioritize, is this one of the three that they should do by building a business case around just solving this type of problem? And, and, and many companies sort of forget to do that, partly because it's, it's not very direct response in nature. Like that kind of uh, content doesn't have an immediate payoff. But if there's not a market leader uh, sort of owning the marketplace, 
to sort of grow that um, demand, then everyone else suffers. Now, what we see is those best uh, solutions in the marketplace advocate for you should solve this because it you know has this ben- business benefit. And if you get around to solving it, this is why our approach is, or right. this is why a certain approach is the best approach. So you're sort of leading to the next question. So that next question is, all right, I've decided to solve it. There's three different approaches in the marketplace. Which approach is the one that I should do? Again, your content will all be focused on, you should pick this approach, not us versus competitor that does the same approach, this approach. And, and then sort of the next, and then you're leading them to, and once you've decided that that's the right approach for you, uh, this By is the why way, we're the, we're the, the, we're the, we're that the approach. Ones. Got it. That's right. right. So you're shaping that uh, sort of reality. And that, that comes back to that defining that product and buying vision. Hmm. Uh, and so that then you are attracting the right prospects. You're attracting the prospects that align with your worldview. Uh, why you, you know, your reason to exist is you have built a better way to solve this problem. Uh, based on where you think the market is headed and based on sort of underlying factors in the marketplace, your differentiation is based on those beliefs. And so if you're shaping the beliefs that customers have on why this problem is worth solving, why this is the right way to solve it, then once they decide, yes, it's worth solving, yes, I want to solve it in this particular way, now let me look at vendors that do it that way. And it's well, an easier choice. choice. Right. Yeah. And by that point, you've built trust because you've taken them on a journey, right? Like, and and hopefully it's, 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 it's actually, you're not manipulating anybody. You're just, you actually just kind of helping people uncover that problem, right. right? And just putting it in perspective, having thought about it for quite some time. That's right. This is very thoughtful. I, I really like this approach. I think it does rhyme um, well with kind of thinking about you know, how do you build the, the almost a category defining solutions, right? That happen to solve right. an underlying underlying set of problems for customers. You always got to start that with customers. Is is there is this something that you apply at the, is, is this what you help uh, your clients at Modern Revenue Strategies kind of go and figure That's right. out? Right. That's right. Yeah. And and, uh, and and at Modern Revenue Strategies, it, my work's a little different than, you know, what I've done at Kantar and other enterprise companies because... I'm generally working with companies that are at this inflection point of they've achieved sort of product market fit. They've gotten to sort of that first million, maybe two million in revenues. But to get from there to 20 or, you know, sort of 100 million, that's pretty tough. Uh, Mm -hmm. And it's oftentimes tough for them to bring in a full time CMO Mm because those people are expensive. They want equity. They bring politics to it. There's a lot of overhead involved, Mm -hmm. Uh, whereas if they can get some outside sort of marketing leadership, um, that can really kind of propel them to that next stage. And one of the ways we make that easy uh, for companies to do is, you know, companies that have a marketing plan in place uh, have, you know, sort of forex the success of their competitors that don't. And you'd be surprised uh, how many companies, even in that, you know, million a year place, they're still holding their marketing sales, customer success together with, bubble gum and bailing wire. So we can come in in just an afternoon and create a 90 day uh, marketing plan for them that Mm. we generally see has a 10 X ROI on that investment of time and that investment of uh, money of working with us. And then they see those benefits uh, of that and that that really sort of propels them to that next level. uh, Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because you typically don't want to have your first marketing team members to be kind of a CMO type of folks you want right. somebody who's super execution oriented already right. a little already jack of all trades or jill of all trades um and and i think probably more was a demand generation focus or demand capture focus than than some of the other kind of strategic disciplines right like such as That's category right. category definition that you were talking about earlier or you know the plan the plan yeah. building so i think that that makes a lot of sense um, yeah. And, and the thing that we can do, too, is really bring in systems that are best in class. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, we have a phrase around here, system set you free. Uh, because when you've got a system in place, then you're managing the system. And so the CEO doesn't have to come wet, wag his finger at the marketing director and be like, why don't we have the MQLs we need? Or why don't we have the SQLs that we need? Instead, you could say, well, are you following the system? Yes or no? If not, is there something broken with the system that's uh, causing you to not be able to follow it, you're following it, then the system isn't working. 
And so you can collaborate together. It creates a lot more harmony uh, within companies and, and a, it's a lot uh, it, it's a lot more enjoyable uh, to work. It gives you a lot more confidence where your revenues are going to come from. You're not chasing growth hacks or uh, yeah. being held hostage by an agency that's like, just spend more money uh, and, and get more leads. Uh, instead, you're really focusing on a system that that then you know builds your own internal capability, gets your own revenue flywheel running. You're not being held hostage by some external provider. Mark, and this is really fascinating because you have you have these two hats, right? Like where you're working was was early stage, not super early, but like at least you know one to ten versus zero to one companies, and then at the same sure. time you're working with some of the largest brands in the world uh, sure. through Cantor. Uh, still, both both you know engaging was topics around marketing and and typically the big spend areas for um, for both organizations, relatively speaking. What have you found that you brought into your work in in was Cantor actually from working with earlier stage companies, right? Yeah. Like, is there because because I think it's typically the other way around, right? Like you could you could you you bring some large company expertise into small, but I'm curious. You know how how do you th- what's how has this perspective changed? What you what you think you know how you communicate and propose to your enterprise clients? You know what they do. Yeah, so it's some of both, uh, and and you rightly sort of identify that. You know, I, I've had the the benefit of working with you know some of the best marketers in the world. You know, I've, I've built uh, analytic systems for you know Hulu and Nike and General Motors and, uh, you know, the largest retailer in Australia and, you know, spent a lot of time there. And uh, I I work with Meta and and Google on analytics projects. And so it's really amazing to work with those companies and and see the, you know, sort of the horsepower between their ears, uh, as we say, and and the the type of analytical projects that we take on. Um, But oftentimes with really large enterprises, it's just hard to, you know, make things move fast enough. Uh, and, mm-hmm. and probably a lot of your listeners you know, work at large organizations, global organizations, where it's, you know, the just getting things done is its own challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, and in that environment, sometimes it's easy to lose sight of, well, what are we even trying to do? Mm-hmm. Uh, and you can kind of get bogged down in um, the, the, the bureaucracy or the pro- getting it done and lose sight of well, what's the real thing we're trying to do here. Uh, and whereas working with earlier stage companies, uh, there's a lot of focus on what's the thing that matters? What's the, the thing that's going to give us a, a 10x uh, in impact in the next uh, you know, six months, 12 months? I mean, small companies, it really were these early stage companies, they look to double every year uh, in terms right. of overall revenues. Uh, whereas that's pretty tough to do at a large enterprise yeah. that's global. Um, but because they're focused on this, you know, chasing double growth, um, they can really sort of, there's a, an Occam's razor effect of like, what is the most impactful thing that's right. going to really move the needle? Uh, and, and so oftentimes that gives you a focus on, well, what's the simplest thing? Uh, what's the simplest answer? And bringing that back into an enterprise is oftentimes very refreshing to sort of stop chase going down a rabbit hole of saying, all right, this this sounds interesting and all, uh, yeah. but if we're not here for, we're not an academic exercise. We're, uh, right, uh, right. we're a commercial enterprise. Uh, and so what is the po- point of doing this? Well, it's to increase revenues. And, and you know, we build a lot of really robust analytical frameworks it can, you know, be built on years of data at a, you know, daily level even. So that's mm-hmm. huge amounts of data. Um, but to sort of understand, well, how is this going to be used? How is this going to help us grow the business? Uh, can be a really uh, interesting insight. But, and working with more early stage companies helps keep that in a sharp relief. Well, as somebody who who does work at an early stage company, you know, sure. help me. Help me, help me be a guinea pig on what, like, what, what are kind of a couple things that I could start doing today, at yeah. relate to right, and 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 it's not that I I want to grab the limelight, but it's actually probably gr- good illustration of yeah, how you good could help case study, right, help other folks, and you know, you know, just a tiny bit about us. I don't know what you need to, but let's do a role play, you know, sure. um, of sorts to see like what yeah. how I can apply your ideas. 
and then how yeah, our so audience we, more importantly could apply your ideas in their context as, as i'm doing this yeah so we've had a, a wide-ranging conversation today and so it's a really good sort of call out of like well where do you start um and you when you and i were uh, kind of prepping for this call you know we we talked about your business and you said you know the most important thing is to build sort of trust yeah uh and then um once they trust you, you want them to believe that you are the fastest path uh, to sort of speed, to interactivity, and, and that it's easy. Uh, and so one of the, the things that we do is, is sort of a foundational. So that's that really sort of speaks to bringing in new customers. So it would mm -hmm. be in what we call attraction systems, sort of mm -hmm. your ability to attract those right prospects uh, through having really... It creates demand while generating awareness. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a few things to you know sort of un unpack there. First, you talked about trust, and from a B two B sort of branding perspective, I we think of trust as a two sided coin, uh, and the mm -hmm. two sides of that coin are sincerity uh, and competence. So sincerity means you do what you say, um, and then competence means you have the ability to do what you say. Right. And with and without both halves of that, you really can't achieve trust. And so the way that you you know sort of build sincerity is about you know demonstrating transparency and and being not making claims about things you can solve that are actually outside of your you know sort of core capabilities. Being very real, uh, and then from a competent so not being salesy. Like if I put if I put a word on it, like the op, like I'm putting in quotes because the best sales reps are not salesy that's they're, right they're just helping people solve problems but like being being authentic like this is what we do this is where we can help if we can't help you know we still want to help that's you right. find, solve your problem okay got it all right so that's sincerity yeah and then on that competent side it's about reliability uh and you know sort of showing your success but a lot of it is you know sort of um continuity and, and sort of saying the same thing over and over. And so one of the things that really it increases competence perspectives, this is why people spend a lot of money on advertising because it creates this, you know, sort of frequency of they're there, they're always there, they're, they're, we're hearing this message over and over. So that gives the sensation of reliable. But one of the ways that we have seen uh, to accomplish the same thing without spending a lot of money on ads is to please have tell consistent... me, please tell me, because we have yeah. not spent, this is how much we spend on ads. <laughs> so by having a consistent storyline uh, that you tell as people are evaluating, is this a problem to solve? What are the ways that we should solve it? Is this one of the ones? What, what are the vendors that provide it? A consistent storyline that aligns with your product and buying vision mm. uh, that talks about how you're different from competitors, how your sort of long-term product and buying vision are uh, sort of different than other solutions in the marketplace. Um, that consistency uh, is is much more powerful than just the consistency of a frequency of ads. Uh, and, and the way that you achieve that is by coming back to this sort of customer journey map mm. uh, and really understanding what are all of the the things that prompt them? What's the context in their environment that causes them to think about, is this a problem I should even solve? What's the context in their environment that goes, oh, so now I should prioritize it to one of the three things I can do this year. Uh, that goes to, well, as I think about, you know, the different ways to solve this, this is the right way to solve it. So mm -hmm. what is the context? What's that buying journey so that you can have that um, sort of consistent messaging throughout and then through a real deep understanding of your, you know, sort of ideal customer profile and the buying personas of your champion and your decision maker that are part of that buying committee, you can know where to reach them in lots of guerrilla ways uh, that give you the opportunity to have real authentic, comf you know, competence and uh, sincere interactions. Uh, and that's what really builds trust in a much more powerful way than ads. Ads build trust too. They're just much more expensive and much less sophisticated. But when you really understand that customer journey, um, you can find all of these little, much less expensive opportunities. Basically, you're using customer. customer journey to to try to inject the right, the relevant 
stories that kind of connect the dots to the broader narrative exactly right? like, so okay. exactly mm -hmm. um and then the the other thing that you talked about was sort of this you know, speed to interactivity or ease and one of the exercises that we do on that is you know we'll do a, a competitive analysis uh and and so we'll look at you know on measures of speed what are your competitors talking about you know are they uh, and and we're going to assume that that you've rightly identified that's what your audience cares about, which is a whole nother exercise. But let's assume that right. that's true. Um, so let's look at what are the reasons to believe they're the fastest uh, way to get interactivity, um, and then you know sort of rank those and look at which of them are differentiated, which of them are the same. I, mm -hmm. I spent a little bit of time looking at you and your competitors. A lot of you have very similar badges from very similar uh, places. So that just becomes sort of market parity. There's no differentiation there. If you've all got a G2 badge of some kind, uh, then that kind of just says, well, we're all the same. Uh, and so the, you, you can lose by not having parity with the market, but you only win by being differentiated from your competitors. Uh, and so if you have to sort of line up of this speed to interactivity, what are proof points? What are proof points you have that are different? Uh, and then this other dimension of ease, of how easy is it? Well, what are proof points you have? What are proof points you have that are different? Uh, and what we oftentimes will do is build sort of like a two by two matrix where we'll you know take five competitors and we'll rank them all in terms of, you know on one matrix is you know sort of speed to interactivity. And then our other matrix is this, you know, sort of ease of accomplishing that. Uh, and then we'll look at the reasons to believe that are out there in the marketing materials uh, and sort of plot them based on the strength, sort of both logical and emotional, the strength of those, uh, you know, sort of reasons to believe or, you know, points of parity or differentiation in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. oftentimes you start to see some white space. So we'll do like multiple plots. So we think so about I like guess a four I, by I four. Guess if, yeah. So like, let's like, if we deep dive into that. So the reason I said that is we were, we were actually sh shocked that like the, when we looked at the kind of p some of the peers that build like advanced interactive content, they all, you know, you have to book a meeting with a sales rep. Right. And you have to, you know, from there have maybe have a second meeting and then you, maybe they send you up for a page paid trial for a month and we're like hey they're, hold on this is, like, this is the way business was done like 20 years ago right right well, and, and they're, they're saying we're easy to your, use uh... right like yeah so so like is so we just like this is obvious and we started saying well we're relatively you know always been relatively easier plus we have a different take on the market uh, and so we started changing our price plan which we allowed it easy, you know easy to use setting up without talking to anyone see for yourself so how do you like so we're doing these things but how do you market that to the world without talking about competitors because ultimately like it's not right like we're ultimately not like really obsessed about competitors we're obsessed about delivering um you know value to the customer seeing them that it's that that's the right fit but it is sometimes it is in a competitive context especially if they already are in the, like late in the buying journey um they're comparing certain things so what's your advice, you know, on the emphasis of this stuff, right? Because if you, like, if the badges, well, I don't think people, you know, the, I think the badges are still important because I think badges, typically people well, do they are because categories point, well, but they don't, like, it's become table stakes. Do, yeah, yeah. yeah because, if everybody has the badges, yeah, yeah. then you have to have them too. But again, they're not going to let you win. They're just going to yeah. keep you from losing. Yeah. Uh, so you hit on something really, um, really smart. So uh, in brand strategy, the way that your brand, you know, sort of connects to the marketplace through your product itself, that's the real authenticity. That's how you really show sincerity and trust. Uh, and so your customer is going through this experience with uh, competitors of, well, they've got to schedule this meeting and then they've got to schedule this meeting and then they've got to schedule this meeting. That's not easy. Uh, and so if they're, if that competitor is saying we're easy, but they're making them jump through all these hoops, there's a disconnect between their messaging mm. in the marketplace and the mm. experience of working with them. And that disconnect 
builds mistrust or it erodes right. trust. Right. Whereas if you say we're easy and then you make the experience of working with you easy, the customer, and, and these are sort of subliminal perceptions that the customer has of, there's, I believe them when they say they're easy. And maybe they don't, they can't exactly say why, uh, right. but there's an authenticity about the way that you are going to market uh, that underpins your, uh, your message. Now, uh, I'll give you an alternative. If your positioning is we're thorough or we're stable, then maybe all of these hoops and meetings and lots of interaction, maybe that supports your brand yeah, positioning. Yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah. if your positioning is easy, right. then all of those things fast. Yeah, have to yeah. disconnect in the yeah. mind of the customer, even if they don't uh, sort of name it out, out loud. Now, well, I, you I can, can tell you one takeaway. You can right? call their attention to it. Well, and this, yeah. so this is how you do it in marketing. Call yeah. their attention to it. Say, yeah. you're looking at other vendors. How easy is it to work with them? Right. So then how easy do you think their software is? Yeah. Uh, and and so that really starts to underpin this uh, core positioning uh, that you've put into the marketplace of we are easy to work with, our software is easy to use, and then it, it creates this continuity and, and consistency that uh, really compels them. Oh, this is brilliant. I was going to I was going to weigh in be, because you triggered another idea. And this is really fascinating, the sort of dichotomy between people saying they are something to the market and how they right. actually are perceived. So, I mean, I find it ridiculous. Uh, uh, and and I think our some of our, our pioneering customers are realizing this, that people are selling digital transformation on a piece of paper or right. they are, they're like, we're data driven or data driven X and they have no idea what happens with their content for example that's right you know, in the the most important content the stuff where they actually like closest to revenue right like so we're like okay so are we really data driven right or that's right. we are creative here's a pdf built in 1980 style you know right. visuals right uh you know or we are exciting here's 80 pages of single space text right. you know <laughs> that will make you lose your will to live you know this is this is this is not exciting and it's it's and it's it's kind of it's really easy to be dismissive uh and it's not meant like that at all because i was at probably like committing these sins right like at, when i was in these are in the organizations large organizations you're kind of just you know you've got a lot going on you're you know you're juggling but there's the sort of people that i love that are kind of starting to that are intellectually honest with themselves and that have an innovation kind of potential that are saying, hey, we're totally incongruent, right? We're like, right. I'm excited to see you, you know, you know, like <laughs> that doesn't work, right? And so it's in, right. like, and they know you don't do it in the meeting, right? But you, you right. somehow think digital, you can get away with it. Like, we love videos. Here's a PDF with no videos right. inside it. No video <laughs> <laughs> the the future of marketing is video. We don't have a single yeah. video on our website. Yeah, or that, right? Like, and it's it's sort of like can and and you know, are people would people prefer as they are become aware would they prefer to be congruent? I think so. Oh, right? absolutely. Like who well, wants to you know who what doesn't want to be? But then there's the tools and the the difficulty and the complexity and like new way of doing things, right? And so it's a journey, it's a journey of change. And, but like I think majority of people aren't even aware of how um, oh, no. how bad it looks, right? Like I don't know what your take on, on well, that. Well, because they haven't thought through um, the the medium as well as the message, yeah. and in in marketing that that's as important as as anything, particularly in the modern age where there are so many options for mediums. You know what right. I mean? From you know whether it's paid channels or, or, you know, sort of earned, owned, paid, like all of those different uh, things, you have so many options. There's so much technology, broadband is everywhere. Like you, you have every option at your fingertips. And so if you're not making choices that are congruent, then you're undermining trust because you're not showing sincerity uh, to, you know, sort of what your statement is. Um, but at the same time, it's not wrong for everyone. Uh, and so like 
thing is it's, it comes down to really understanding your differentiated positioning. Because if your position is you don't want to work with some upstart company that might not be here in six months because you're a large enterprise, you need someone that can handle your global business. Or And I'm sort of making these things up. If that's your positioning that is differentiated and, and really helps you sort of capture a certain niche within the marketplace, then being recalcitrant or, you know, slow or, you know, looking like you uh, were made 10 years ago, that actually aligns uh, with that uh, brand positioning. So just fast and innovative, that's not for everyone. Uh, yeah, but I think that's uh, fair. About understanding it. I think that's 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 actually a real really interesting insight, and because I think what we see is reality. It's you know we kind of I just made some of those remarks, but it's 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 actually there's probably one universal thing that we see, especially in complex content, is that everybody's a bit overwhelmed, right? And so, um, but and yet you still need to be because of the nature. It's a complex industry or complex sales or complex transformation journey how do you keep things simple while not losing the evidence or or not losing the kind of supporting materials yeah and so sometimes it's not about hey here's a shiny video um you know that shows that we're hip was the times right like it may, it may help but in some businesses but not everyone but it's almost always like we are easy to work with we are organized and so we're going to present to you a, the types of experiences that help you, you know, get get stuff done. We are pair. We are maybe we're exciting, but we're definitely safe hands, right? And how do we show right. that we're safe hands? Hey, we, here's a journey that you need to go on. Here's like here's kind of how we organize. How here's how we make it easy for you to go get on that journey. I think that those are pretty much universal in B two B. They may not be that relevant in consumer universe um but i don't know what's well, what's your take are there some you seeing some universals there and and you know you you've obviously helping companies kind of look their best in front of sure. their 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 current customers and their future uh customers um you know how do you find that kind of trade-off uh, between you know organized and yet or and exciting and, and you know is do sure. they're like is there okay. a Perfect medium somewhere. So it starts with the customer. Uh, and, yeah. and because you're starting with the customer, you, there's a different answer for every business. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you look just like your competitors, there's no differentiation. There's no reason to buy. Uh, and so you have to really understand what is your customer looking for? And, and you talked about, you know, well, every customer wants ease. Well, ease towards what? Uh, mm -hmm. And so it's really a differentiation uh, for a different customer group. So some customers want it to be easy to try um, because they like innovation and they like to try new things. And they're in sort of the, the early part different. of this adoption mm -hmm. curve. If you, you know, uh, know, um, you know, crossing the chasm or yeah. any of those mm -hmm. great folks. Um, and so if you're competing on ideas, you need to make that idea easy to try. However, other companies, they want ease of, you know, getting through their legal, uh, you know, process or getting through the contract. Uh, that's a different type of ease that you signal that you're going to be easy to do that by showing, hey, we've already got a 30 page contract. Hey, we've already got a legal team that's going to, you know, help us navigate that. That gets in the way of what's ease right. of trial ability. But it facilitates someone who wants ease of, you know, having a, you know, sort of larger corporate uh, process. And so it's about understanding the customer, which mm -hmm. aspect do they care about, and right. then leaning all in on how your company is specifically uh, designed, your buying vision, your product vision mm -hmm. is specifically mm -hmm. aligned to their vision. Uh, and that's how you attract the right customers so that, or the right prospects so that your leads grow your business instead of killing your business you talked amazing, about amazing which is a great great way to uh wrap up right where we started at your book that's right mark super uh super helpful thank you for you know applying helping me apply this and process oh yeah process this, this in my universe hopefully this was uh full of nuggets for our audience what where can people find you 
and engage with you best? Absolutely. So I'm actually going to give an offer to the first 50 people uh, of your podcast uh, that want a copy of the book, the full book, as well as some calculators, templates, some uh, training videos that go deeper into some of the concepts is available at modernrevenuestrategies.com slash free download. So modernrevenuestrategies.com slash free download. First 50 folks will get a copy of uh, the book as well as the calculators and, and uh, sort of email boot camp. And Thank then you. if they uh, want to follow the company on LinkedIn, uh, linkedin.com slash company slash modern dash revenue dash strategies or just search for it, uh, it'll come up. Amazing. Mark, thank you so much for the offer. I think you'll have some, some I think it's going to be 48 because we'll have a few folks <laughs> from Relay to signing up for this. So uh, uh, thank you so much uh, for sharing your insights and, and bringing so many disciplines together uh, from both enterprise, consumer, data-driven and investment in, in marketing and advertising. This has really been a great chat. Thank you. Yeah, I really enjoyed it, Alex. Thanks so much. Welcome back. Alex Shivalenko here. Thank you so much for listening to Experience Focused Leaders podcast. You can learn more about us at podcast.relato.com. R-E-L-Y-T-O dot com. Obviously, we would love for you to send this to people that you know who would be great speakers or just share the nuggets that you took away from this episode with your community on social. And you could learn more about what we're up to on relate2.com. You could certainly connect with me on LinkedIn where it's just very easy to spell my name. You have to have a master's in Ukrainian. It's Shevelenko, S-H-E-V-L-E-N-K-O. Would love to connect so that we can move together the way the world communicates about its most important ideas. Thank you for listening. We hope to see you next time.